Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Rangers Review Morning Briefing for Wednesday, the 3rd of April. I'm Derek Clark, and I'm joined for the first time this week by Joshua Barry. How are we doing, Joshua? Was I not here on Monday? Well, you were here on Monday. I was here on Monday. Yeah, can't yeah. Been, can't have been memorable, but uh, yeah, yeah no, <laughs> good, good, good nonetheless, and I uh, hope everyone is well. It's because it was a bank holiday. I'm uh, losing track of when the week actually started, but uh, here for your second stint. So uh, there we go, folks. Um, before we talk all things Rangers, quick word for our podcast sponsors. NPH Boilers have got some cracking deals on offer just now on their Weissman Boilers. Uh, they also offer a free internet controller. They've got great uh, flexible finance options on offer as well. The all-important links are in the description below, so do go and check them out as that, if that is something that you are thinking of. Um, right, um, bit of news. Uh, you'll see on their website, folks, uh, those who are subscribers on there, I've got a brilliant interview Chris has done with Dave King. It's the first of a two-part interview, the first uh, on the website this morning. He talks about uh, watching Rangers as a pure supporter now uh, and not uh, as uh, the club chairman. Uh, he also talks about the, the Rangers board and how uh, the club are in safe hands. He goes on to talk about James Bisgrove uh, as well and about uh, Philip Clement. He admits he never knew too much about the manager uh, before he arrived at, at the club, but uh, he is uh, well on board the Clement train at this moment in time. And uh, yeah, very interesting uh, to learn uh, what he thinks about the, the current regime uh, and how Rangers are shaping up at this moment in time. Joshua, well worth a read. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's an interesting read. It's not so much, um, I guess it's more a bit of a feature on a bit of life after being involved in Rangers or, or direct as directly as involved in Rangers um, from Dave King. We know he's not always, um, shall we say, being the most complimentary of, of those that are in his position after having left said position uh, as, as you know, head of the Rangers board in recent years. So interesting to I guess really hear his thoughts. This is part one, part two is tomorrow. Um, what he really goes into is his, his thoughts and, and why he is backing um, both John Bennett and, and James Bisgrove, the Rangers chairman uh, and Rangers chief executive, um, to, to, to build on the success that he feels wasn't built on sufficiently or um, areas in which Rangers did not kick on sufficiently after the 155. Now it's, it's normal across sporting company across sorry sporting teams Derek I think when such a big achievement is achieved which was the kind of end goal um for the, the growth after that to be slightly stagnant and I think we certainly have witnessed that in the last couple of years at Rangers after it felt like in that summer of 2021 they were really going to uh, kick on but yeah well worth the read goes into a lot of details about um James Bisgrove and John Bennett some of the details about watching on uh, as a fan now in that experience tomorrow he speaks more about uh, Philippe Clement and the current season as well. So, I mean, it's the type of content um, you get every day on the website, uh, not not Dave King every single day, but you get um, exclusive content every single day. You know, we've got interviews um, with, with uh, it's Todd Campbell on there today as well, speaking, um, I believe, at the back end of last week about a number of interesting details, which we'll come on to as well. So it's well worth the subscription fee um, for interviews like that alone, but you're getting plenty of that um, yeah, plenty of that every single week. And then you know, much cheaper than a newspaper. Newspaper is going to set you back about £2 a day. You're getting that for £4 for four months. So, £2 yeah, a day, wow. Two, yeah, exactly. I know, I know, I know, I know. How can you, uh, how can you afford that? So yeah. it, it's an interesting interview, and I think it gives some, some perspective as to Dave King's um, relationship with Rangers now, and certainly, I think the, the big takeaway from day one, Derek, is is why he does believe that that, that John Bennett and James Bisgrove can build um, what what he feels needs to be built at Rangers and and lead the club in a, a certain way. Certainly, from from his perspective, so uh, yeah, I would encourage people to go and read it. The links are in the description to that interview. Yep, uh, it's, it's a cracking read. The first of a two-part uh, interview, folks. Uh, Chris is done well again on the website uh, this morning. Uh, this is what it's all about, this show this morning. Josh says, uh, painting my hall this morning, miserable Ranger review, helping me through absolutely superb stuff. Uh, actually decorating uh, our house a little bit well. And, uh, Us too. Uh, yeah, so. podcast really helped, don't they? I can't do it without podcasts. So <laughs> I feel, I feel you're, getting, you're getting your kitchen done, Josh, aren't you? How's that going? It's been done, uh, wow. it's been, and it was actually pretty. Uh, five minutes into the show, when we're talking about kitchen. Stuff, <laughs> uh, it was actually um, it's pretty seamless, Derek. No, no major 
hiccups. Um, so yeah, it was uh, yeah, not not a relaxing experience, but not as stressful as I thought. What about you're not getting your kitchen done, are you? No, no uh, we're doing our bedroom. Uh, we've been in the house for about five years. It's the first, but it's the only room we've yet to sort of sort out. But uh, it's mm-hmm. getting sorted now. But there's uh, clothes ev- everywhere. Uh, you know what it's like when you, you're decorating, folks. So, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully it will be sorted in the next uh, few days. Um, but people aren't tuning in for uh, it's not uh, changing rooms, uh, what show that was, uh, or anything like that. The people are tuning in because they want to talk uh, Rangers. Uh, you mentioned there, Todd Cantnell, Joshua, another uh, great. Uh, to, to um, an interview from uh, and Matty on the website as well, where he discusses a number of things uh, that Aris substitution when he was uh, hooked yeah. uh, just after the half hour mark, I think it was uh, yep. back in that Europa League game. Uh, he talks about that in the chats with Philip Clement. I'll read you what he had to say. He says, uh, no player wants to be that player. Listen, me and the manager have had a lot of conversations and I've got a lot of respect for the manager. I think he is a good person as well as a good manager. For me personally, in football, you have to hide your ego a little bit sometimes and you have to understand that things aren't always done for your best interest. It is the club's best interest. I think we've got a manager on our hands who cares very, very much about the club. I won't go into it, but we had a very honest conversation and it was a very respectful conversation and I think it has been a very positive on the pitch and off the pitch. Yeah, me and the manager are in a really good place. Uh, He was also discussing... Uh, that all changing number 10 role, he says, I think you, um, about changing under Clement as it was under Michael Beale, he says, I think you could argue that it's definitely a different number 10 role to the number 10 role I was playing under Michael. But listen, as a footballer, you have to be able to adapt and you have to bring different parts of your game. That is something the manager has really honed in on me, with me. I would like to think I do have a good attitude. The club uh, is always more important than any individual. I believe that it is probably more important here than at most clubs. For me, it's been at the right end of the trophies at the end of the season. For me, that would be a, a good season. Uh, you've got a few diagrams as well, Joshua, just to uh, highlight how that role has changed. You wrote a great piece on, um, I think, the first week of the international break uh, on Cantwell and how his uh, number 10 role has uh, changed. Uh, we done a video as well on it um, yeah. a few weeks ago, um, but I thought it was uh, very interesting to hear from him. Yeah, this is a so specifically talking about. There's a comment here at first from um, where is it from uh, Stephen that says that Campwell substitution set the tone for Clement's management, and I, I think that's really true because Campwell. We we spoke about it quite often in the last few weeks, Derek. But I think he's an individual individualistic player, and, that, and that's not to say that he doesn't work hard for the team. But the, the things that make him good, the fact that he takes risks, that he wants the ball in all situations, that he takes responsibility. Um, it, it is exactly what sets him apart. And there's going to be downsides to that point. So I think sometimes when you ask him to be a right winger and play kind of on the wrong side, if he was to play in a wing, I'm sure he'd choose the left wing and stay positionally in, in one zone. I don't think that's that's always going to suit him. I remember writing an opinion piece after that situation though, and, and saying, I think Clement actually dealt with the situation well. People felt that on that night, if it's, if memory serves me, Derek, that should have been Lammers that came off in Campwell, and, and instead of Campwell, and Campwell moved to the number 10 position. But obviously, McCausley came on that night and scored. And then Campwell was put back into the number 10 slot uh, that uh, that weekend against St Mirren. So it wasn't something that was allowed to linger. We speak, speak repeatedly about the, the importance of man management um, for, for Philippe Clement. And it wasn't a case, I think, of him trying to throw Campwell under the bus. But probably an example of what he needed to do, he felt, to get a result out of that game. And what to do when a player wasn't necessarily following instructions, and and I don't say following instructions in a, in a kind of defiant sense, but more that um, uh, if you look at the actual breakdown of how that goal happened, and we spoke about it a lot at the time, um, what Campbell is trying to do compared to what he maybe should do, quote unquote, in that situation. Again, I just think so that speaks to the type of player that he is. But his number ten role again, this is a, a much wider discussion. When Lammers was signed in the summer. Campbell started to play a little bit deeper. Now, he had played deeper at points in the previous season, hadn't he? But he's ended the season as that kind of higher number 10 position and played really well. But this uh, pass, Matt, this just shows the uh, successful passes that he received. Uh, Let me just check which one's which. Yeah, this is the successful passes that he received in his final three games uh, before Clement arrived. So that was the, the old firm defeat. I think maybe St. Johnson away. I can't remember if Campbell played in that game. But the last three 90 minutes that he played, 
or 75 minutes, whatever it was, before Clement came to the club. Um, and if I just compare it to the last three games he's played um, under Clement, you can see just, um, I'll, I'll flick back to the previous image, Derek, but um, he's receiving higher up the pitch a lot more often. He's less involved in the build-up, running in behind a bit more regularly. It's, it's quite a, a stark difference for playing slightly different positions, but still a kind of free roll um, from the midfield. And and perhaps it's just taking him a little bit of time um, to get used to what Clement wants, which is not always moving towards the ball. The attacks are built at a slightly quicker pace. Um, as mentioned, he's not really dropping into the fullback slots as frequently to get on the ball and try and start play. However, I think that you were starting to see before his injury why Clement's football could benefit from someone like having Campbell in there, especially a game like St. Johnson away where the pitch was really bad. And that's where actually Campbell got injured, wasn't it? Um, the pitch was really bad. But if you watch that game, I think Rangers really benefited from having someone like Campbell who can take the ball in difficult situations, who can knit the team together. Um, and he still had to adapt to what Clement wants as, as he wants. He was asked in that interview, has it made him a better player? And he said maybe um, it has. I think he was kind of in agreement with that. Um, but simultaneously, I think you're seeing why Clement's football has benefited from having that kind of confident uh, player in the middle, uh, as Campbell told us, I think, in last week's press conference is his best position. So, um, yeah, Rangers need them to have a really big game at the weekend. And I think that's all that's, that's, that's missing. I still think he needs that big old firm um, performance, which he yeah. played well on the one at the end of, of last season. But that game, you know, didn't really mean anything in, in significance of um, of where the trophies were headed at the end of the season. Um, and, and, and just finally, he's saying there um, about the team coming before the individual. And I do think he yeah. plays like that. He, he tries things, as mentioned, but it's not that he's, he's not, he doesn't not work hard for the team. I don't think you could accuse him of, of ever um, shunting that. I just think that sometimes as indiv we think individual players aren't playing for the team because they're trying things. That's what makes them good. That's, that's how they take risks. You probably need as a manager to try and temper that slightly, but get the most out of it. And, and I think that's the, the journey that, that Clement is on to get the best out of, of Camp Miller Rangers. Yeah, totally agree. Rangers need a performance out of him on Sunday uh, if he starts. I'd imagine he would do. Uh, I was disappointed in his uh, showing at Parkhead. I think he was asked to do a uh, a number on, was it Callum McGregor perhaps? And it just sort of, uh, he wasn't able to express himself as much as uh, he would have liked, I'd imagine. But uh, as you say, Josh, it is all about the team. Uh, I do hope we see uh, a proper uh, Todd Cantnell performance at the weekend. Uh, let's get to a few points that are coming in before we get to uh, what he talk, said about referees. Uh, RFC Five Star says, got to say, I love the Daily Podcast, but can't speak highly enough about the website. Always great articles. Well, thank you very much, buddy. That is very kind of you to say so. Um, and uh, we know that you're tuning in uh, from uh, far and wide. We'll discuss this uh, shortly, but Nate gets in touch. Hello from what Hawaii lads uh, couldn't no. miss the show even on the holiday. Any news on Ridvan? Uh, we'll discuss that in a wee while. Um, but we'll get a proper update on him when we speak to the manager on Friday around uh, lunchtime. Uh, let's all hope he is fit enough to start the game. If not, we'll discuss uh, in a little minute. Uh, who you uh, would prefer at left back, Joshua? Um, but Todd Catmull also discussed uh, the uh, refereeing calls and being targeted by opposition teams. He admits that he's been disappointed with the inconsistency of refereeing decisions during his time at Rangers. He says, it's something I've probably had most of my career. I'm the sort of player who probably invites tackles with my dribbling and the way I like to play. Do I think that some teams look at it as an opportunity to try and stop me? Yeah, I do. But it only works if it stops me and I don't think it has. The injury I got was a hamstring. Listen, it happens it's part of football. To be honest, if I was on the other team, I might try the same thing. It's a compliment. Uh, it always has been ever since I was a little kid. I've always been the player who gets tackled a lot. It's the way I play football. I know that. The manager has made it clear that he doesn't want to change the way I play, uh, but at times I can maybe be a bit smarter and protect myself as well. That is another learning curve for me. Uh, for me personally, the number 10 in the team is to create, to be a bit of a maverick, to be the player you probably look to and say, oh, I didn't see that coming. With that, you're obviously going to make mistakes at times and people are going to say he is forcing things. Uh, you're always uh, going to be the player 
who is targeted by other teams as well. If someone can make something happen, they're going to try and stop him. That can be physically, mentally, it can be anything. That is my responsibility to be ready for that. I don't think you can compare the football up here to down south. I certainly don't think it's faster. I think it's probably slower, but it's definitely physical. Teams just play a different style. Uh, the way that we play and the way that play, most teams in the league play is different. Most teams will try and drop off and set a boundary and say you're not coming into our box. That is down to us to challenge. It is different for sure. Uh, and just on uh, those refereeing calls, he said, I don't think it's over physical up here, but I think some of the tackles and some of the decisions are questionable. I have always found from my personal experience that the first tasty tackle should always be booked because it sets the tone and shows you're not getting away with that. The problem that I struggle with is the consistency of that because sometimes a tackle will be booked instantly and sometimes it won't. Mine tend to, don't tend to be yellow cards. It tends to be a yellow card for me if I am on the other side. I think that's a fair comment from uh, Todd Catnell, Joshua. Uh, I don't think that, that the old saying that the first tackle is for free uh, and you get the first five, ten minutes to uh, go through someone, that really shouldn't be the case anymore. So I can see where he's coming from. He is targeted by opposition teams. I'd imagine he'll be targeted again on Sunday. Uh, yeah, he's maybe referring to that St Johnston game, uh, which was, which is, you know, he was injured off the back of that, and there was probably, you know, a number of of challenges in that game. Um, where, as you said, I, th I think it's the, the wider culture, and there's a wider discussion about um, how you, you you get rid of that. But um, tackles are a big part of the game in Scotland. I think the one on Ross McCausland recently at Ibrox is a good example of, and, and something that Clement has yeah. uh, referenced repeatedly. It's not necessarily about um, does this always merit a, yet, a red card or a yellow card. It's about the, the force uh, behind tackles, the type of tackles uh, you, you don't want to see. Um, in football, all, all of these things tend to agree with it. You get a better product um, if you have a, a stricter, um, if, if you enforce those rules slightly stricter. So agree with that and interesting to hear him talk about uh, that number 10 position. When, when I did an, an interview last, uh, I think it was last season with, Campbell's youth coach at Norwich, who coached him for, for many years. Maverick is the the word that he actually used to describe his, his playing style right throughout his youth career into his professional career. So I, I think that's right. He's someone who needs to try stuff. At times, he'll make mistakes. There's a lot. There'll be a lot of pressure on him on um, on Sunday, Derek, because if Rangers are going to win that game, I think what set, what stopped them from winning that game so repeatedly is the lack of um, final third decision makers or difference makers, someone to take a moment someone to to grab the game in a, a certain moment in, in a way that Celtic have had with, you know, Keogh scored, I think, seven goals in the old firm calendar year uh, last season, which is quite a big difference to if you look at what Rangers had up front. Um, I think probably their top scorer in that the fixture was was James Tavernier with with three goals. So they'll need to Cantwell or, or, or others, Seema from the bench, maybe Dessers. Um, they'll need people to to step up and take those moments and, and ultimately do it in the big moments, which is uh, yeah, which is what will really cement legacies at a club like Rangers. So intrigued to see how he gets on uh, on, on Sunday. I think he yeah, could really do with a big performance, but he's coming into it in, in a good place. Uh, even if Campbell has been injured over the last month since the start of twenty twenty four, you're probably seeing, I would argue, is his best football at, at Rangers so far. Yep. Uh, Ross Nielsen with an interesting point. He says Sunday isn't a day for a maverick, Joshua. That's the issue. Uh, yeah. I, listen, yeah. I, I, I mean, you look at the fixture last year, like, where, where's, that, there's been so many tight games and what have Celtic had. If you look at the at the game at Parkhead recently, the goal that Kyogo scores, of course, of course it's a day. Yes, you need your, your team to play well and everyone to do their roles yeah. and, and all that uh, conventional stuff, but it's a big fixture. You need big players to step up and big fixtures i don't think there's there's not anything particularly interesting in, in what i'm saying there um i just think that campbell needs to do it in that fixture and it's a bit like the tillman discussion last year Derek, mm -hmm. where yeah he hadn't had a big game in an old firm um and that was really held against him he was a young player who had a, a really good loan move um you, you you just need i think one or two players who thrive on that pressure who um are able to to provide um, in, in, in big moments because Rangers simply have not had that. I don't think if you watched back the seven old firms from last season, even when Celtic were probably a better version of this Celtic team under Postacoglu, who's now obviously gone down to Tottenham, there was a number of games that I think were, were pretty close. 
the Scottish Cup semi-finals one that springs to mind. I don't think the, the League Cup final was that close. The game at Ibrox, Michael Beale's uh, first old firm game, the game at Parkhead, the 3-2 defeat where Suter and Davies made the, th those mistakes. A number of games, I think, where those games have been very much decided in the boxes, which is something that managers say, I think, to get them out of jail a little bit at points. Um, but that, for me, has, has been true. Rangers have really lacked decisive players in the final third. So whether you call it a maverick or, or whether you call it someone uh, something else, there'll be a lot of pressure on that game on Sunday. And I, I think that's something that's missed out with no way fans, Derek, in the discussion about it, is that there's so much pressure because it's just a cauldron of one team, uh, one team's fans who are so expectant. That requires players with the ability to try things under the pressure and, and, and make mistakes and do something different uh, to step up and win the game. I, I think that'll be a uh, key on, on Sunday. Yeah, that changes, of course, next season when the away allocation returns. Uh, could you have uh, Alec Robertson tuning in from uh, Breaking Bad Territory? He says, follow, follow from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, which wingers would you prefer starting on Sunday? Uh, this was an interesting point. Me and uh, Johnny uh, touched on this uh, a little bit yesterday, Joshua. I think the manager's got a bit of a selection dilemma uh, with who starts uh, in the forward line. Uh, we touched on uh, Kamar Roof and his comments on Roof. Uh, it begged the question, does he feature at some point uh, on Sunday? I think Serial Dessers will start. Uh, yeah. He's got a decision to make who starts on the left and on the right for me. Uh, does Fabio Silva retain his place or uh, does Rabi Matondo force his way into the manager's thoughts after his uh, stunning goal from the bench uh, against Hibs? Uh, and then on the right, uh, it sort of ties in with uh, the chat from a few moments ago about Ridvan, will he be fit enough? Uh, if he is, uh, does, does John Sterling start on the right-hand side? Does Ross McCausland able to start out there? Does even Scott Wright start the game? So uh, lots of uh, variables there. There is lots of variables, and I think the deciding factor will be, does Ridvan play? Uh, because if yeah. Ridvan plays, if he's fit, that changes a lot. If Ridvan plays, I think you can play Fabio Silva ahead of him. Um, if Ridvan doesn't play, I don't think you can play Barisic and, and Silva. We, we did a long piece on the website yesterday if people want to read it that looked at why Rangers Rangers didn't concede much in the way of chances uh, actual shots on goal against Hibs but in that first half in particular I thought they looked pretty open as exemplified by the goal that they, they did concede um, and for me a lot of that it has to do with the structure of how the fullbacks play and what is natural to, to Barisic's game if Sterling is not fit I would probably be inclined to, sorry if, if if Ridvan is not fit, I'd be inclined to play Sterling at left back. Sterling has to play somewhere. I don't think there's yeah. any doubt that he, that he starts um, somewhere in that team. But Diomande and Lundstrom, I think, will both play as well. I think that the midfield will be Diomande, Lundstrom, and, and Campwell. Um, if Ridvan is fit, then, then he definitely plays. Um, and then I think it would be Silva ahead of him and Sterling from the right, probably. Is there a, co a conversation in Abdal Sima? Um, playing from the start, maybe it's a little bit soon. However, you, you never know if, if he is back physically fit. That this line between match fitness and, and, and actual sharpness is something that's discussed quite a lot. But you, you, if you have Sterling and, and Silva in there, do you miss a little bit of breakaway pace in behind? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure. The, the only thing I'd say about Ridvan is we know that it's not a severe injury. Um, Clement is not someone who makes a habit of giving players a chance of making games that they're not going to make. And and I think you saw this with Abdala yeah. Sima. When Sima was injured, Clement was actually relatively not happy about it, obviously because of the nature of the, the injury. Um, but he wasn't that downbeat. And probably for me, the reason he wasn't that downbeat is because he knew we can get through these couple of months and he'll still be able to play a big part in April and May as has materialised. He was, he was back right at the end of March. So for me, Clement doesn't give Ridvan that opportunity to make the game if he's not got a pretty good opportunity of making it. If he's fit, he, he 100% plays. I think he's one of, you can make a claim at the moment that he's in Rangers' top three or four most important players for his individual quality, but also the way he allows other people to play, the, 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 uh, just the dynamism he gives you from, from left back. Dujon Sterling definitely plays somewhere, um, and, and I'm not really sure after that. I mean, what, what, what do you think? Would you, do you agree if, if Ridvan is fit, do you think it'll be Ridvan from the left, Sterling from the right, yeah. and Silva ahead of uh, Ridvan on the left hand side? Uh, yeah, he probably. Um, with, uh, I mean, Matondo and Seymour are very good substitutes to bring off the bench, aren't they? But uh, yeah, I'd want a bit of pace uh, in behind. I do worry that Rangers, uh, if they have Matondo and Seymour on the bench, whether 
to have enough pace to, to begin the game with. Uh, Sterling, uh, yeah, I did say over on the right-hand side, there was a comment that came in, should he play more centrally and do a, a job on uh, Callum McGregor, who's uh, likely to come back into uh, the game. Uh, whatever happens, I think Dujon Sterling has to start wherever that is. But we know he can play wherever. Uh, so, yeah, I'd be starting at Dujon Sterling. Uh, and it's up to the manager. That's why he's paid the, the big bucks to uh, make these calls in the forward line. Would you have Kamar Roof on the bench, Joshua? I'd have him on the bench, yeah. Um, it was interesting, wasn't it? Because you, you arrived at the game on Sunday and, uh, sorry, Saturday. Yeah. No roof in the team sheet um, made your way up from the press uh, press room and there he was on the pitch. Uh, so, and, and as Clement said after and as we spoke about again in that in interview on the website yesterday, um, it wasn't as if he, he'd be suffered an injury. It was to do, it seems, with Clement trying to balance his bench out because he now seems to have a few more options than he's tended to have uh, over the course of his time at Rangers. So, I, I definitely would not start him. Uh, I don't think that's even a, a conversation because... Um, Yes, there'll be chances early, and yeah, there, there's some starts, but but also roof. The roof is not going to last ninety minutes in that game. No, but if the game is tied one-one at seventy minutes, and you've got roof and Seema to bring off the bench, what does that do to the home crowd? That gives them a lot of belief. So, yeah. I, I I think he will be on the bench. I think I do have a sneaky suspicion that Seema might just be ready to start. Sterling definitely comes into the start in 11. But the, the biggest news to come out of that press conference, and rightly so because of his performances recently, Derek, will be is Ridvan ready to play? And if he's ready to play, I think he has to play from the start. Yeah, uh, this is a comment on, on Sterling that a, a flag from Paul. It says, Derek, do we need to play with a 10? What about Sterling next to Lonnie and Diamandi with Catnall on the right? I don't want to see Catnall on the right uh, again, Joshua, but I think that experiment has, has been done. I know the manager said it was because of uh, a lack of options out there. I would be surprised if we've seen that. Yeah, I don't think that, that, that'll happen. Maybe in a, an away game. Um, yeah. I, I think it's a really fair point that Callum McGregor is one of Celtic's most important players and Rangers have not, certainly in the first Old Firm game of the season, uh, did not counter that threat anywhere near enough. Um, but they need, I think they just need Campbell to have a good game in that regard. Sterling definitely plays. What about Tom Lawrence? Because I, I said this to jo uh, Johnny yesterday. Um, yeah. Could Tom Lawrence feature over on the left wing or, or perhaps on one of the flanks? Or does he, does he start the game? Does he come off the bench? I think he comes off the bench. If you look at even the, the weekend, Eric, when Lawrence is you know, he's he's not played a game recently, just off the back of the international break. Come on, always wants to start. I, th I think two specific types of players on the right and the left side. He wants people, I know S Fabio Silva isn't necessarily a, a kind of winger, someone who's going to drive at people with the ball, but he's that second striker. And then on the other side, Come on, I think, uh, wants someone who'll run at players. One of the, the hallmarks of his team so far has been kind of more ball carriers, I think, um, and not trying to shoehorn players. No, we've just spoke about that with Campwell. Um, I think that was quite specific to the options he had at the time with Ross McCausland just coming through. McCausland's maybe a, a shout as well, but he's not he's not started in a number of weeks as so you throw him in for... I don't, think, I don't think it's a game for him to chuck him in. Yeah, but then he started the, the old firm away from home, didn't he? So... Um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. For me, it'll be Lundstrom and Diomandi. Diomandi will need to have a, a big game, but for me, one of his best games, probably his best game so far, was actually Benfica away against one of the most difficult uh, young opponents in, in Europe in João Neves. So, um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be Lundstrom, Diomandi and Campwell for me. But then, it's equally, Derek, if you've got uh, Lawrence, if you've got Roof, if you've got Sima from the bench, um, there's options there. Matondo is a decent shout because... He scored that goal and he has had, he's not been consistent this season, but he has had a lot of bright moments, hasn't he? Um, although it's always been stopped by injury, but I'd be surprised if he plays um, ahead of Fabio Silva. Again, I, th I just think so much depends on, on Ridvan because if Ridvan plays, he can get away more without playing a winger on that side yeah. because he's capable of moving outside. He can beat players uh, and run by players from, from wide positions. If uh, Ridvan can't play, again, I'd probably be inclined to play... Um, to, to, to play Dujon Stern at left back because he'll play narrower. And I just think when Rangers are trying to defend transitions, that'll be really important in this game. Yeah. Uh, we'll wrap up with this uh, comment. An interesting one from Blue Eyed Boy. He says, uh, Derek Josh, if we go on to win the title, 
where would this one sit in comparison to previous titles? Uh, the best one for me, Helicopter Sunday, the second one, uh, just because it was just the sheer surprise and the elation uh, in the final uh, few minutes of that game. Uh, this, for me, in my lifetime, the most impressive, given where Rangers uh, were, uh, to where they are now in contention for the title is quite remarkable. Um, so I think this would uh, sit proudly at the top. Joshua, you? Yeah, tend to agree. I was very young at Heli when Helicopter Sunday happened, Derek. But um, you, you probably compare it to when Clement arrived, and and they've won one trophy. A lot depends on this game on Sunday because if Rangers yeah. were to get to get beaten, that would really take the, the stuffing out of the, the run. Um, but it's been so impressive since he came into the club. I don't I don't think he could have done much better. You're looking at maybe okay, the old firm game away from home. Um, but you look at that Dessers moment again. I don't think that was a game that was necessarily decided where one team were far more dominant. I think one team had a lot more decisive, a, a decisive player in the final third, and have experience of winning this fixture a lot recently, and that showed. But outside of that, Aberdeen away, okay, but Rangers had a lot of chances on that day. I mean, Clement has, in difficult uh, circumstances, done a pretty incredible job so far. So I, I agree with you. But what I would say is a long, long way to go. Until then, and, and Rangers have not won, and not, not, not to dampen the mood before uh, Sunday, but Rangers have not won a meaningful old firm, I would say, since um, that Scottish Cup semi-final yeah. uh, nearly two a years ago in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a pressurised environment. And, and in terms of a, a league old firm win, the last really significant one would be what the the, the game under Steve, when, when Steven Gerrard was... Uh, sick with COVID and, was, and wasn't there in Hollander, who we heard Holland from on the website earlier in the week, scored the winner. Pro probably, unless I'm, I'm missing one. Seems like a lifetime ago now. Off my head. That was um, two managers ago. For, well, that was three managers ago. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And of course, the one at the end of the last season, yes, it's still a meaningful game. But the argument I'm making is it didn't have, it wasn't a pressurised game where, where anything was riding off the back. The, the title was, was decided. I don't, I don't yeah. think it would be uh, an argument about that. So, what I'm saying is there's a lot of pressure to go and win this game. If Clement can win it, then I think it absolutely supercharges you on to the fact that you can then go five points clear, can't you, away at Dundee in midweek. And that is a huge margin going into the split. Um, but yeah, big ask. Uh, I think they'll be really confident, especially being at home, and they should be. And uh, looking forward to, to yeah, building up to it over the next few days. Yeah, it's uh, well and truly building up uh, already. Right, folks, we'll wrap up there. Huge thanks to everyone. Uh, for those that are YouTube members, uh, I think we'll, uh, I will we'll record a Q&A show uh, a little later on this afternoon, so hopefully you can join us for that. Uh, I spoke to uh, a Romanian journalist very close to the Hajis yesterday. He gave us an update on uh, Yanis uh, and his uh, situation at Ibrox, uh, how he sees it unfolding uh, amid the Galatasaray links and the pressure on him ahead of the Euros in the summertime as well. So do go and check it out. Um, uh, as touched on earlier on, is that Dave King interview, the first of a two-part exclusive over on the website just now as well as uh, the Todd Cantwell interview as well. £4 for four months or £18 for the entire year. rangersreview.co.uk forward slash subscribe to sign up. Right, we'll be back again tomorrow. I'll be on with uh, Chris and Stevie. Uh, which will be yes. uh, fantastic. So uh, looking forward to that. I uh, hope you can join us then. Until then, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Bye for now.